1557, the, um, the Stations Company was granted a royal charter, and it was a charter from the Catholic Queen Mary, and essentially was a, a means to control the uh, circulation of printed materials. It's a ploy which was very well established on the continent. It's basically a guild-like structure, and the only way you can publish if you are a member of the guild. So there was a monopoly, monopoly to, the, to the stationer's company, um, and that was um, a way to control the circulation of, of um, printed materials. Through the internal processes of the stationers' companies, then many of the dispute resolutions and registration processes evolved. And um, it's a turbulent time, so the, you have the period of the Commonwealth, the, um, you've um, got the restoration, and you um, got the Licensing Act of, of 1662, which is, um, again, a blatantly um, uh, instrument, an instrument blatantly designed to regulate the press. So it makes, a, again, a requirement for, for a, a book to be registered before it is allowed to see the light of the world. And um, if you look in the, um, in the courtroom on the wall, there is a later version of the Royal Charter of, of 18, uh, 1682 by Charles II to the Stationers' Company, um, which is one of the most beautiful of, of the Royal Charters. And, um, if you hear, I think it's again worthwhile looking at it. So how does all this give rise to the birth of the modern copyright system? Well, um, the licensing act lapsed in, uh, in uh, 1695. So um, there was a period of time, almost by accident, where uh, free for all um, began. So all pamphlets turned up and books could be printed without permission. And uh, there was heavy lo lobbying um, in the following decade, and eventually it led to the statutory system we now know. So in 1710, the first statutory copyright in, in the world, anywhere, um, was uh, enacted. And as part of that, there was still a requirement for, to obtain copyright, you had to register your work in the registry book of Stationers Hall. That book is up there, you can still see it. And that requirement was in place till 1911. So the, um, the, it's a, in Bern terms a constitutive formality. It's a, you, know, you can't have the copyright unless you register. And that obviously caused problems and once the uh, UK joined Bern that had to be changed. Um, and the, the registration petered out. But there's a lot of interesting data in that book which is available for, for researchers and um, I would invite um, some of our economists to have a look at that at, at some point. Okay, so the hall you sit in today uh, was built after the, um, the Great Fire. Um, there was an earlier uh, stationless hall on, on the place, but not of, of this uh, grandeur. And then later on there were many additions, but this hall, I think, in pretty much the paneling and the, the layout is, is uh, the 17th century hall. So if you deal with digital matters, um, a little bit, a little weight of history is not necessarily a, a bad thing. We, we get very caught up in the, in the topic of the day, and it's quite useful to, to step back occasionally and, and, and see the bigger picture. Um, for Kuwait, it's the second big London event um, in a month. Um, on the 12th of March, um, we launched the Copyright User Portal, which is a, a um, digital resource aimed at media professionals um, creators and users, um, and it's an attempt to create from bottom up the questions which interest in practice. Um, so on the screens in the other room you can see some examples of that, and we launched that um, at the Creative Industry, uh, Creative Economy Showcase of the HRC on the 12th of March. And in its first month, and again I need to show off a little bit, make it worthwhile, for you to, to listen to me. Um, uh, so there were 2,000 unique visitors in the, in the first month and um, 6,000 page views and a quarter of visitors come back. And we've had very good reviews for, from, from various sources for that resource. Um, and again, this is something which has not been attempted before. Um, normally, we think of copyright as something we need to tell people about, okay? So we, we design 
um, our resources in a way uh, that we teach the creators what they should know. We did it the other way around. We asked them what they didn't know, what they wanted to know. We did that in two ways. We looked at the most frequently asked questions about copyright on the web and then systematized them. And there are a couple of people in the room who have done that. Um, I see Danusha and here. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and the whole uh, uh, family of other contributors, I don't want to single them, them all, all out now. Um, and Bartolomeo Meletti, maybe, who uh, was the lead producer of the, the portal. Um, Chris Erickson, uh, but there, there, there's, there's so many, Haley, Vinitza, Ronan, Wusthaus. So there, there's a group of people here in the room who contributed that portal, and again, I, I warmly recommend to you to, to have, have a look at it. Um, in some ways, the approach is not so different from the UEA study in that we try to understand what makes people tick before we make prescriptions. Um, so um, behavioral economists may be quite comfortable <laughs> with that uh, effort. Um, CREATE is a team effort. So it's a consortium of seven universities. Um, and we have quite a few of the representatives here. So we have um, my deputy directors, Lillian Edwards, Philip Schlesinger here in the first row, and we've got uh, management committee members from, from all the consortium uh, members, but St. Andrews, I think. So Nottingham is here. Um, there is Goldsmith, Janis. Um, we have Edinburgh. And who have I forgotten? That's pretty much the whole list but Clyde Glasgow, obviously. Um, and I would, again, uh, uh, part of this event today is, is to probe what academic research is in the eyes of the user and also in the eyes of industry. And we um, are here to be probed and challenged. So we don't want to play it safe. Um, and if you have a challenging issue for us, yeah, come and, uh, and um, challenge us. Okay, today's study, I think, in my view, it's a breakthrough in the study of the digital condition. And you may say, how can that be? Um, it's only a review. Well, it's a systematic review. And it's a systematic review in an area which has not been um, treated well by um, commissioners. So almost everybody who's commissioned a study had an agenda they have a reason why they want a particular type of data examined for a particular type of result. And therefore, at times, it's important to reset the state of the art. And you can't do it better than, than in the study you have in front of us. And I think as CREATE, we are um, proud of, 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 um, of that effort. And. Um, The way we designed the response panel is that every sector that is addressed in the study um, had the right to nominate a speaker to react to what, what the study finds. Remember, the study just reports what other studies have done. Um, and um, so we systematically approached the umbrella body bodies of each of those. So UK Music for, for Music, and then Publishers Association, and so on. And we asked them to put up a speaker and if they didn't put up the speaker, we went down snowballing. And um, so the panel you will find later has been constructed, self-constructed in that way. So there was no deliberate intervention. It was an opportunity to give the industry a way to respond to what academic research finds. I would also very briefly introduce, like to introduce Alison Brimelow, who probably doesn't need an introduction. Um, <laughs> um, I think almost everybody in the room knows her as the yeah, former president of the EPO and as the uh, former chief executive of the, what was then the patent office. Um, we're extremely pleased that um, Alison has agreed to chair our uh, advisory council and um, Alison will also chair the discussion afterwards. So I think that will be probably the, the last you see of me. Good, okay, took a bit longer than um, the usual introduction, but um, I hope you forgive me. <laughs>